I get a lot of comments on uh, our videos, and one of the consistent comments is, why do I think that the International Energy Agency's announced policy scenario is the most likely outcome uh, for the energy transition? And <clears throat> one of the, uh, you know, that the APS calls for peak oil demand in 2030, peak gas demand pretty close to the same time, and oil demand in particular declines fairly quickly after 2030. And that has all kinds of implications for, for North America, and which is, a, you know, the big, world's biggest oil producer. So here's, I want to explain this to you as quickly as I can. Uh, the, the energy media has its own energy transition theory of change. And, you know, we're not modelers, we're not mathematicians, so what we do is geared to our journalism. And essentially it has two parts. So the first part is uh, we track clean energy technologies uh, up the S-curve. You know, it starts at the bottom of the S-curve and moves its way over dec some, you know, usually decades that gets to the inflection point, which is the little bendy part of the, the S. And then at that point, it's competitive with the fossil fuel technologies. And then it begins, it, cause it's competing in the marketplace. And eventually over time, it gets better and it starts pushing uh, those technologies uh, out of the market, displacing those technologies. And I think we, we can comfortably say that uh, wind, solar, batteries, EVs, and heat pumps, which are the sort of the core clean energy tech, uh, reached their inflection point around 2020. And we're starting to see now they're taking, taking market share. So that's the first part. Uh, oh, and then you know, once they get to start taking market share, then they get up on the, the growth part of the S-curve, the sort of the, the hockey stick part. And then they very quickly uh, begin taking market share increasingly on an exponential basis. So the second part of, of, the, of the model uh, is all about disruption. And it's based on the ideas of uh, Clayton Christensen, who was a, a professor at the Harvard Business School. And his idea was around innovative disruption. So a new technology comes along and it's good enough to that it takes customers away from the dominant business model. And the most obvious example here is, you know, that you'd be familiar with would be uh, Blockbuster and Netflix. So in 2006, Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix for $50 million. You know, they, they did their due diligence. The management team had a look at the business plan and the technology and said, now nah, we're going to pass things. They just didn't believe that there would ever be enough infrastructure to deliver broadband that would support Netflix's model. And they just didn't see it working. Well, four years later, Netflix had eaten their lunch and they had to declare bankruptcy. And the, so streaming video uh, is a, in that context, is a disruptive innovation. And the big disruptive innovation that's relevant to our work is in the automotive se uh, sector. So the automotive industry uh, is, has been, uh, you know, the internal combustion engine has used oil for 125 years, never had a competitor, uh, and, but it does now in the form of electricity and, and EVs. And so I don't think it's even, you can't even ar contest this argument that, uh, that China, which is now the world's biggest uh, auto manufacturer and exporter, uh, is so clearly disrupted the legacy automakers and electric vehicles are rapidly disrupting the, in, the combustion engine vehicles. The percentage of vehicles sold each year over the last five, six years that are combustion engines is shrinking. I think the last year it was 75%. This year it's likely to be 70%. So it's losing market share. This is exactly what you would expect. So what our model does is we track those disruptions. You know, it's, it's a daily basis. We're reading news stories, reading studies, reading data. Just, you know, it's a, you do stories on it, you interview experts, all that kind of thing. And you get a sense of where things are going. And so once, the next step would be to look at modeling, energy demand modeling, and compare what we're seeing in the, in the evidence to what the modelers are seeing. And there are probably, I don't know, a couple dozen uh, you know, reputable uh, agencies and firms that, that model oil demand, model gas demand. And so uh, they all have different assumptions. So everybody has their own little wrinkle. And on, you know, at the extreme ends, you've got OPEC, which sees oil growing way out to 2050 and beyond. And then at the other side, you've got Rocky Mountain Institute that sees oil demand falling off a cliff because of the rapid uh, adoption of clean, you know, EVs and, and so on. 
And I would have to say at this point that based on what we've seen, the IEA APS scenario, peak oil demand 2030, decline two, three years after that, the decline starts. And then it goes down by 2050, they forecast uh, 57 million barrels of demand per day for oil. And compared to 103 million barrels, I mean, that would be disastrous for the global oil industry and for Canada, right? So the big assumption that makes sense here, and actually this is spelled out really easily, uh, uh, very plainly uh, in OPEC's modeling, World Oil Outlook 2045 and 2050. And that is that uh, the global north will electrify slowly between now and 2050 and oil demand, which is already in structural decline, will continue to decline out to 2050. But the global south, where all of the emerging economies are and, and you know, people want middle class uh, inc uh, lifestyles, they want, a, they want a car, they want two cars, they want you know, what Western, uh, the global north has. And that will not only increase the demand for petrochemicals, but more importantly, uh, the demand for oil, for petroleum and diesel, will actually grow in the global south quite rapidly, in places like in Africa and Latin America and, and, and Asia. So the, the real I the issue, the, the, if you want to track the most important variable here, it's what's going on in the global south. And then it becomes, what's China doing in the global south? because China has become the world's first electrostate. I mean, it's, a, it's literally you know, state policy that they're going to electrify. They're rolling out renewables in the power sector. They've got tremendous capacity to build electric vehicles, like twice as many as are built in the entire world every year. And so what they've done is they've targeted the global south uh, as the area that, uh, that where they want to grow the most. And so they're not only pouring exports and I think this year it'll be two or three million uh, EVs uh, this year, uh, but they're also building plants, and they're also uh, uh, full assembly, uh, construction plants, uh, manufacturing plants, uh, but also uh, fabrication or assembly plants, you know, where they ship over the car in pieces and then local workers put them together. And, and they're also sending over, you know, really cheap, solar panels so that you know communities can cities and so on can can uh, generate their own electricity and charge up their electric vehicles they're investing in infrastructure like ports so they can ex they can export to two countries based on all of that uh, the I would say that the electrification of China and the global south is proceeding faster than the IEA is uh, is forecasting in fact the IEA has uh, said, I was reading an analyst the other day, and, and he made the point that all of our, uh, it's going so, so much faster than we think that our medium term expectations are now become our short term expectations. Our long term expectations are now our medium term expectations. Time is being compressed is what he's telling us. And because there it's happening so quickly. So that's why I think that the APS demand, uh, oil demand scenario was the most likely. And if that turns out to be the case, then you know, uh, demand is going to drop, prices are going to drop, and it'll be interesting to see which oil producers in the world can survive. And you know, it's no guarantee that they can't, the Canadian producers are not low cost producers, they're mid range producers and they've got high GHG intensities, which is a competitive disadvantage. So anyway, now you know that's basically uh, where we uh, come up with the, the rationale, the model that we use to arrive at the fact that the APS scenario is the most likely in our opinion.